like to have a little celebration for the, the writers who appear in the anthology uh, here whenever we get the chance. So it was nice that we were able to do this. Um, I served as the um, editor of the 2019 anthology. Um, so uh, it's been five years. I've almost fully recovered. <laughs> um, and part, uh, one thing you learn is that you become part of a, a, you know, a, a family of these people who, are, who, who organize this, uh, led by Anita Leahy, who's the series editor. And, uh, and that feels uh, uh, nice and warm and fuzzy. And then you remember that if you're in a family, you have to work sometimes to contribute to it. <laughs> So Anita enlisted me to uh, to represent the um, the series kind of and pull this event together. Uh, there's spots right over here. Feel free to walk right in front of me. It's not a problem. <laughs> this, is, this is one of my students. It's one I don't get to tease her about this in the future. And that's very, uh, very enjoyable for me. So that was great. Um, um, Sorry, where was I? Okay, um, so I was asked first and foremost to pass on um, a great thanks for you all coming out, and obviously their regrets from um, uh, Anita Leahy, the series editor, and Bardia Sine, the um, editor of this particular um, edition, who made who actually made the selections for what appeared in um, the anthology. Um, and Anita, in addition to sending regrets, sent me uh, a couple paragraphs of. Here are some things that I would love for you to say at the beginning, but I'm going to paraphrase. I'm going to just like quickly write them out, and you can make them sound good later. And I looked at them, and they're they're pretty good, but also it's much funnier, I think, if I just read them to you out loud um, instead of paraphrasing them. So I'm just going to read to you what um, Anita said to introduce the series. Um, and the first part is just just to me, I guess. But she says that each year, a different, intrepid, dedicated, and perhaps slightly bonkers for agreeing to take this on. And then she says, okay, maybe don't say that. Uh, <laughs> guest editor reads as many poems as they possibly can that were written by Canadians and published in journals the previous year, whether in print or online. Um, I can say for my case, I counted them, it was about 2,300, I think. I can't remember. It's a lot of poems. Um, um, that guest editor reads as many as they possibly can, published the previous year, or in print or online. The poems aren't submitted or nominated. Uh, they speak for themselves. Best Canadian Poetry, therefore, indirectly pays homage to the whole ecosystem of literary periodicals and the editors who pull them together and the poets who send out their work and finally the readers who go looking for the poems that fill those pages and those screens and for what those poems offer. Uh, Anita goes on to say, I like to call Best Canadian Poetry a yearbook or an annual touchstone that over time, given the slightly different perspectives each guest editor brings to the task of selection, provides a fairly comprehensive view of contemporary Canadian poetry, what poets are concerned with and how they are playing with the craft in its many forms. It's also a poetry gateway project. We put this anthology together hoping that each year it will attract some new readers who are curious about poetry, especially poetry being written now, in and of our time, right here in our own communities, um, but who don't know where to start. Then in brackets she adds, I think maybe this is all getting to be a little bit of a broken record, but it's my best way of thinking about it and describing it so far. <laughs> um, to all that, I say ditto. Um, Anita, Anita's the series editor for a reason. She knows what she's talking about. Um, best Canadian Poetry and its events um, are kind of these uh, little movable parties that, that move around. Um, both launches like this and the party that happens in your living room or bathtub or wherever it is you happen to pick up the book and read it. You can recreate it there. Um, they're a way to honor, as Anita puts it, um, the whole ecosystem that makes poetry possible across this country. Um, in this room, I see poets, poetry students, the poetry curious, the poetry uncurious who are nonetheless loyal friends and family members <laughs> to poets. And, uh, and especially I see organizers, lovers of poetry who create spaces to bring us all together. Um, one such art organizer is uh, Massey Arts and Books, and please let's give them a hand right now. Uh, and Brandon, who is an amazing poet. I didn't connect the dots yet. Uh, first get introduced by a very, very fine poet. That's lovely to see. Um, and I'd like to open this reading, um, just get us, get us warmed up to poetry uh, with a poem by one such organizer who I happen to spot in this room uh, and one of my favorite poets, and that's Danny Pert. 
Um, Danny has been organizing events and publishing books in our community for many years, uh, and his poems, like his personality, never fail to make me smile. Um, here's one from his 2012 collection, Ruined on Love, Ruined by Love, sorry, which feels particularly apt tonight. It's the first poem in the book. It's called The Artist's Calling. It opens with an um, epigraph by Jules Lenard. Um, the epigraph is, writing is the only profession where no one considers you ridiculous if you earn no money. <laughs> the artist's calling. It could be that you've been called to be an artist. You poor sod. There's no dental plan. Paychecks are irregular at best. Your mental health will be suspect. Working hours are long and uneven. Holidays, all unpaid. Women might be drawn to you at parties, but would be fools to marry you. <laughs> uh, bankers will look at you as if to say, you're kidding me. Sometimes your friends will be artists too, poor buggers. Try to remember that it's not your fault. A call came in, only you could answer. <laughs> Uh, the structure for tonight is that uh, you're going to hear from eight poets from the anthology. They are each going to read their poem that's in the anthology and one other poem. So you get a nice flavor of what happened, what is in the anthology. Uh, each poet will be introducing the next in order, so you don't have to see me that often. Um, yeah, that's, that's all I have to say about that. Okay, and, and our first reader is going to be... Uh, oh, and they're going to go in the order of the anthology. So if you, if you already purchased a copy of the anthology... Um, you will be able to move um, slowly through that, which I like to implement those things because my last name is, starts with a T and I go last all the time. And then we ran it through the system that the, magazine, that the anthology organizes them in, which is by the alphabetical like title, and I still am basically at the end. <laughs> <laughs> um, Nicholas Bradley. Uh, Nicholas Bradley lives in Victoria, British Columbia, in the Kwangan ter Territory. He's the author of two books of poetry, Rain Shadow from the University of Alberta Press 2018, and Before Combustion, which just came out in the fall and is really fantastic, um, but from Gaspro Press. He teaches in the Department of English at the University of Victoria. <laughs> I only write poems that start with A, <laughs> just in case. This is a, a poem I wrote after the so-called atmospheric river of the autumn of 2021. And at the time, that was a, a term that I didn't know, that's what the poem was about. Um, but I think the poems have become dated already. We seem to be having more and more atmospheric rivers nostalgic tonight for wearing a mask and for thinking about the first time I learned this word. And this is written to an old friend of mine, and it's written in the style of one of my favorite poets, Richard Hugo. Atmospheric River. Dear Kit, you said the storms taught you something new, a weather term you hadn't known. Well, you and grim me and everybody else. What's a pedant to do but consult the good book? The dictionary swings and whiffs. Phrases? None. Etymologies? None. Definitions? None. Quotations? None. Full text? Take a wild guess. I look at these sweet nothings through my own zeros, leer at drone footage of the crumbled Coquihalla Highway and the streaming porn of liquefied cities. Above my mask I'm always fogged. Water water everywhere. You tell me it's drier than normal on your side of the Rockies. The rain got stuck in traffic. I know the bow a little, elbow too, and my lips are cracked on your behalf. I dreamed I was an ocean and woke up soaked and coughing bedclothes a lake. Aren't all rivers atmospheric? That's why we love them, breathe them through our gills and taste them with our feet. The skylight's drumming. When this cold breaks, I'll write some more. Till then, I dispatch your rightful precipitation and all my best from this drenched island. Thank you. 
The next poem I'm going to read is actually the next one in the book. It starts with the letter B. Uh, it's by Luke Hathaway. It's called Ballad, and I'll, I'll read Luke's bio and statement about the poem. Trans writer Luke Hathaway lives in Jibuktuk, Halifax, and teaches at St. Mary's University. His book, The Affirmations, was named the best book of the year by the Times in 2022. Me too. He often writes words for music and, a performer as well as a poet, he is enamored of the stage. He frequently collaborates with singer-scholar Daniel Cabena as part of the metamorphosing ensemble Anima. A ballad, Hathaway writes, I had the good fortune to grow up surrounded by storytellers. I heard the Irish Selkie stories for the first time when I was still a child, and they have stayed with me. They were part of the mythological language of transness that I inherited from my people, from my various peoples, long before I had languages that could operate in the social, legal, and or medical spheres. Those other languages have not replaced the mythopoeic for me, they have affirmed it. At the same time, they need to return to the mythopoeic to replenish themselves from time to time. Transitions are almost always more complicated than we give them credit for. There are the social, legal, and medical stories, but there is also a spiritual story. There are gender transitions, but there are also transitions that take us across the boundary between life and death, between one existence and another, across the lines between species. Ballad. I was well past childbearing years, and children had, though only three, when I was walking on the strand, and a sea gray selkie said to me, Oh, come away, my beautiful one, arise, and come away with me. I am a man upon the land, I am a selkie in the sea. Oh, how can I away with you, a man I have, and children three? If you had come when I was young, I would have gone away with thee. And home I went to my husband true, and bounced my babies on my knee. But my dreams were full of the Selkie's song and the Eli, Eli of the sea. So I went down to the shore again and said, All right, I'll go with thee. Come up and claim what is thine own. No answer came from the seal gray sea. So I went home to my husband true and sang to my beautiful children three, I am a woman on the land. I am a Selkie in the sea. Oh, come away, my beautiful one. Oh, why hast thou forsaken me? <laughs> And now I'm going to announce, or introduce rather, our next reader, who has a new bio, which is why I'm reading it on my phone. Joanna Streetley has lived in the traditional territory of the Klaokwia on the outer coast of Vancouver Island since 1990. An immigrant from Trinidad, she is the published author of four books, and her work appears in literary magazines, anthologies, and Best Canadian Essays 2017. She recently won the FBCW Literary Rights Poetry Contest, and has been listed for the Canada Rights Creative Nonfiction Prize and runner-up of the Spectator's Ship and Ipal Award. From 2018 to 2020, she was the inaugural Tofino Poet Laureate. Joanna. And I'm also the person who forgot my glasses. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I don't okay, know. Uh, I borrowed some from this wonderful person, <laughs> and um, so I might have to be experimenting with the glasses and how they, uh, the distance from the <laughs> from the books, and all of these things, and microphone as well. Okay, thank you. Buklasish Joanna Hustuk Shultsish Nachiks. My tongue and I are learning Tla'okwet, um, so I'm trying to practice it um, uh, because I'm sure if we lived in Mexico, we would speak Spanish, so Tla'okwet uh, is my nearest language. Uh, so the poem I'm about to read is called Dyer, and it's, um, it's a poem about the loss of my uh, stepsons, um, who I had, uh, I kind of lived with them from the time they were old enough to crawl onto my lap until the time they were old enough to not want to crawl onto my lap, and then that relationship ended. But I was still very close to them, and they died um, mysteriously one night um, on a very, very strong spring tide when their boat went down um, for no reason flat on seas. Mm -hmm. um, and so this 
poem is a bit about looking for them and uh, partly about all the things you find that aren't the thing you're looking for, if you even know what it is you're looking for. Um, Jire. I did have stepsons. No, I should say I do. And I did look for them, but I should say I didn't find them. No one found them. I should say my stepsons were not found, unless you count those few bones, that tattered shirt, the Levi's that lasted all those months in the kelp. And did you know that kelp beds, the kind that are impossible to propel your kayak over or through, the kind that make a carpet on the sea, one that makes you believe you can walk on water, did you know that those kelp beds are keepers? Whole collections, white styrofoam dots, water half drunk in plastic bottles with blue labels and blue lids, sleeping sea otters, sometimes more than one, half shells of mussels floating like blue Venetian gondolas in circular canals with no exits, tiny minnows that leap for no reason and land not in water, but on blades of kelp, some ridged, some smooth, all of them growing before your sunlit eyes while the minnows in their silver straitjackets jerk and gasp. Deeps and shallows. These bones once Dance the deer dance, played at stepping through water with exaggerated slowness. Blue heron, oh great one, your disproving side eye. Catch me if you can, a cormorant diving, flash of dark motion, not a hand waving. Paddle further, crab float, orange and black, not a life jacket. Eyes becoming tunnels, arms becoming wood, legs becoming sea through the hull of my kayak. Slippery boys becoming fish, becoming deer, becoming clouds. Every time I look, they are somewhere else. And me, the last to spot them. I dredge pop-eyed dreams, distended song ladders. And I should say that nothing is the past. I should say that I search circular canals with no exits, knowing I do have stepsons. I do. Nothing is the past. They are there in my ribcage, knocking. Um, and I'd, I'd like to um, read a poem uh, by Jide Salawu, um, who is in Alberta, so he can't be here. Um, by the way, great representation, uh, Western Canada, doing well here. Um, and I had a really nice connection with Jide about his poem, um, which he wrote after Kai Miller's poem, uh, which was called A Cartographer Maps His Way to Zion which was a conversation between a map maker and a Rastaman. And this poem um, is called A Cartographer Maps His Way Out of His Country. And in this, Jide imagines the cartographer more as a Nigerian youth. And I, I think what I found so pressing about this poem is, you, you know, um, the issue of migration and all of its perils. Um, and the situations that prompt migration uh, should all really be front of mind for us because um, it is coming to affect all of us. And are, you know, um, in this case, he talks about those migrations at sea that are so perilous for so many people. Um, he also um, writes. Um, 
he was pondering about his self as a cartographer because he was a black migrant student and he has intentionally used Nigerian idioms in Pilgrim, such as the word trenches, which means similar to ghettos, to foreground the peculiarity of Nigerianness and also, if you like, the Africanness of the problem. Um, a cartographer maps his way out of his country. A cartographer talk. Say his country now suffer head and maps the sea as an alternative bridge. By that I mean the cartographer dreams of leaving the trenches. The cartographer recounts how Chibok falls into rubble, how women of Baga are led into the dark corridors by the shadows of strangers, how Odi falls on its feet and children cannot lift themselves out of its ruins. The cartographer talk. Say Aso Rock is the kingdom where God and the 24 elders keep the altar clean. He says, Across the street, there is the gut of a woman on the floor, and a soldier holds a man by his neck and screams at him, Guess where dead people go? The cartographer mumbles that the river is a huge jar of tears, and the government advises, There is no need to think about water. He says, it is hard to map your way out for freedom in a country that says this is not your Babylon. The cartographer says, exile is also a famished road, even when you survive the sea. read the um, introduction for the person who comes after me. That's Matt Rader. Matt uh, lives in Kelowna, British Columbia. He's the author of five collections of poems, most recently Ghost Hawk, um, which is by Nightwood um, in 2021. He teaches creative writing at the University of British Columbia, Okanagan. And Rader writes, on June 29th, 2021, the temperature reached a record-breaking 46.7 degrees in Kelowna. The cultural milieu at the time was also very heated. The pandemic continued unabated. Vaccines had only been widely available for a few months, and the backlash was growing. The discovery of 215 unmarked graves at the former Kamloops Residential School, only 100 kilometers from Kelowna, had been announced a few weeks prior. Several churches in the region had been deliberately set ablaze. Heat Dome is a fairly literal account of what I did, thought, and felt that morning. Matt, Matt. I don't have to tell you it's from zero. <laughs> it's like uh, the sister poem to next poem. <laughs> Eto. We swam in the lake at 10 a.m. before it grew too hot. The five of us, two divorced parents, our teenagers, my mother. But the little public access where the with where the neighbor with the tennis courts has a lakeside infinity pool. I have a spider bite on my hip, the exact pinks of the wildfire smoke filter in the sun. In the Similkameen and Osoyoos and Penticton, the ashes of Catholic churches can't cool. Spider bite sky, rashy light. In Xanadu did Kublai Khan a stately pleasure, pleasure dome decree, which is what I remember most vividly from grade 12 poetry. Infinity is when it never ends. We swam out to the nearest boy, a white and pink ball on the surface of the lake. 
We followed its shadowy chain down to a shadowy slab of concrete in the milfoil at 15 feet. What is pleasure without an ending? When the spider bit me, I didn't feel anything. Back on the beach, on our slip of public property, beneath a bower of maple trees, we were cool. How could we be happy, we asked, but we were happy. The spider bite had its own source of heat. It was something inside me. Um, I get a special uh, pleasure today because I also get to represent uh, Seth McGregor's poem, um, which is also set in Kelowna. And even though I put little things in here to tell me where. Uh, Seth is a writer and musician from the Unseen Territory of the Seelk people in the Okanagan. Uh, he now lives in Montreal. His work appeared in, has appeared in Grain, Headlight, and this forthcoming in CV2. This is what uh, Seth has to say about his poem. After I graduated from my Christian high school, I worked for a construction restoration company, Stutters, which dealt with insurance claims for properties affected by floods, fires, asbestos, corpse, corpses, etc. I felt out of place working there, an effeminate, repressed queer man. I wrote this poem after a conversation about the Gothic, the uncanny thresholds. I thought of this house I had worked at, which was devastated by a fire. There was so much evidence of the lives that had lived there, and I remember feeling like I was piecing together the house with each bag of garbage I threw away, storing the artifacts that were left behind and then peeling open what felt like a threshold or oppression of the house. The poem came from that, an encounter with something without context, trying to understand it, frame it. And it became, I think, a sort of mirror for myself at that time, which is what I wish I wrote about my poem. <laughs> um, Seth uh, turned this poem into for a class that I was teaching, and I don't think a single word has changed since the first time I saw it. <laughs> House fire on Cook Road. Bong in the armoire on the floor of a caved in steel guitar. An unmarked urn in the corner above the cupboards, above the piles of ash, wet drywall. Glasses that were shoving into buckets and bags. We're wearing dust masks and stutter shirts. Scott Stone, curly Q mustache, the project manager's assistant, the parvenu, tells me to go downstairs. To cousin? How be it, I slug my weight in ash bags to the garbage pit. I'm 18, and I get to hit some walls with a sledgehammer. <laughs> then I'm given a drill. You take out the screws. The bookshelf I unscrew from a wall in the basement is peeled off its caulk, revealing a small room with no light fixtures, a heat lamp, and a shower grate. We all take pictures. Mm -hmm. It's a sock, also. <laughs> um, I have to find uh, Megan's. I messed up my own system. Okay, you they come from all the way in the back. Uh, Megan Kemp G lives between North Vancouver and Fredericton, where she is a PhD candidate at UNB. She is the author of two chapbooks and The Animal in the Room from Coach Us in 2023. At some level, you already know everything written in the present tense is a lie. This is not an exception. Fourth wall or no, there's a third person here, the second eye, the realer one, disingenuously obscuring herself while simultaneously recreating the other. The two of us, she and I, past and present, now we're assembling together on the page a story that she alone could not have told, then as it unfolded faster 
than conscious thought, faster than the starlight that came to shine and burn and die in the time and place where she was I. Soon, he'll be trapped. Like she was then, desperately, willing the night to end, stuck in the viscous thick of muteness as her friend, who insisted he didn't like her like that, denied and denied wanting to fuck her, though we might refer to that as making love, he once wrote, in reply to one of her messages, objecting to her blunt force of her choice, unfurled his romantic calendar for the week. But no, nobody called it that. Probably needless to say, I've always found ruin more satisfying than creation. The best part of writing poetry is breaking the lines, kicking a foot out and tripping the syntax, exposing the raw nerves, the awkward ambiguities, the bloody beating part of things, hitting the page, coming apart, and together with a violence at once predictable and singular like a body landing, a splattering mess, a brain crush is what he named his feelings for me. Yes, that. He was an artist too, a painter. I could paint you, he'd say. And it visibly scared the shit out of me. And he loved that. He loved seeing any type of reaction on my face. I see now how these simple facts read just as well as metaphors for the intimacy between us and for the lack of it. I wonder sometimes if he ever did paint me, or even wanted to. Possibly the threat's real purpose was just to show me how I looked to him. Unwilling, hostile, muse raging against her own physicality, strange, frustrating woman offering nothing to him, nothing but language and silence. I did not want to be painted. I don't need your permission, he pointed out. True. If you ask me, artistic license is absolute. So here we are, there he is, asking her something about the holidays just past, trying to make conversation, trying so hard to draw her back to herself, to him, but I've already told you it's too late. Is this conversation hard for you, he asks. This situation is hard for me, she thinks, her mind traveling further and further away. We are near crying, she and I, unraveling, there and here, then and now. This poem is hard for me. But hey, look, at last, we're reaching the end. It's over. <laughs> <laughs>